Uh, welcome to Colin Mullitz. If this is not the talk you wanted to go to, you are in the wrong room. <laughs> uh, I'm Chad Haas. I'm on the Android Developer Relations team. I'm James Ward. I'm on the Google Cloud team. And we're going to talk about, let's talk about Kotlin today. So first, we wanted to sort of figure out people's background in the audience. Who here actually writes code with Kotlin? Okay, good. It was just sort of a sanity check. What are you doing at this conference? Uh, all right. Who does Android development? Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I should have said who does not. Who does... Server. Oh, that's me. I'm the server guy. <laughs> <laughs> who does server-side development? That was like all the same people. See, this is full stack, okay. man. Actually, you are in the right room then. Uh, so today we're going to... Oh, and one more survey question. Who does not know what a mullet is? A few people. All right. Okay, we should explain it. You are it. going to learn today. You are going to regret <laughs> learning today, but you are going to learn today, um, but not yet. Uh, so let's talk about Colin Mullitz, um, and let's do that by starting with a demo. So let's pop out to the emulator, and let's show very simple application, Android app. Oh my gosh, so difficult to write this thing. So uh, I'll show some of the functionality. We'll show others as we get into this. I'm going to draw something, this amazing circle here, and then I'm going to do a little ML detection and say, what is that? And it says, I don't know. <laughs> no results. Uh, all right, let's put a little more Self detail in there. There's Chet. Oh, that is totally me. I'm a happy guy. And it says, it is definitely a pattern. All right. Very Some complicated. Truth to that. Uh, Some truth to that. Very good machine learning detection there. All right. So I want to explain a little bit about uh, what is going into what you've seen so far, and then we have many other elements to get into as we go. So uh, what we saw was we're tracking motion events so that it knows where the finger is of the user. We gonna, we're going to add those locations of the finger into this uh, path geometry object. We're going to invalidate the views know that they, uh, so that they know that they need to redisplay themselves, and then they're going to draw that path data that was created by the motion events, and then they're ready to actually do some ML analysis. It's not clear that it's going to be good analysis, but it's going to do some. All right, so the UI layout looks like this uh, with all of the boring details extracted from it. Um, so we've got a spinner there for choosing you know, whether we're going to use shape or digit detection. We've got some buttons, blah, blah, blah. Uh, most importantly, we have this custom view called drawing canvas, which is this thing right there. Uh, so I want to talk about that a little bit, and then I'll show you how the motion detection and the drawing is going on there. So here's our custom view. We have a paint object that we're going to use when we display things. We have uh, methods for getting and setting the bitmap, which is going to be useful for doing ML detection, as well as some of the server stuff we're going to talk about later. On touch event is an override, so we can actually track those finger events and do something with them. That looks uh, like Kotlin. All of this is Kotlin. This is actually a Kotlin talk. If you did not want to learn about Kotlin, you are also in the wrong room <laughs> and the wrong conference. Uh, and then we have the onDraw method where we actually display all of that path data. The onTouch event, it's pretty easy to take uh, finger events or motion events in general and turn them into geometry that you want to manipulate. Um, so here we listen for down events, we listen for move events, and we basically do path move to line twos to create um, that awesome smiley face art that we saw earlier. How many 2D drawing APIs? have you used in your life? Uh, how many have I written in my that's life? What, that's what yeah. I was going for, yeah. Uh, many? I'm going to go many. with many. many. That's always the right answer to every question. Uh, all right. And then when we do the, the drawing in this custom view, we override the onDraw method, and then we just display the path data. Pretty easy. We say, in the canvas object, call the draw path, and that uses the geometry that we created earlier. All right. So that's the basic UI aspects um, to the app that we're seeing so far. Now let's talk a little bit about machine learning. All right, so machine learning in general uh, is this premise where you have a bunch of training data. You have you know, pictures of cats. You have uh, uh, bad drawings of smiley faces, apparently. Um, you use an engine for machine learning, such as TensorFlow, which operates on that data and then creates a model out of that. You can then take that model and convert it into what's called a TensorFlow Lite model, a, a smaller version of that thing that you can put onto a local device so you can do your detection on device, which is what we're doing so far. Um, so we download that down onto the device, and then at runtime, you can have the user input data, so that was me drawing the smiley face on the screen, and then comparing that to the model that was on device using these MLKit APIs, which are using TensorFlow Lite under the hood, and that produces some results. And now you all are machine learning engineers. That's, that's it. That's all there is to it. It is that easy. It is that easy. Uh, all right. So there are different kinds of detection that you can do, uh, at least with MLKit, but for machine 
learning in general. Uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of these today. In particular, uh, we're going to do some labeling. So that was the, the machine learning saying, I think this is a pattern, or you know, I was really hoping it would go for smiley face. Uh, you can do text detection. You can look for barcodes. You can work with videos and detect objects in there. So lots of different things that you can do there. We're going to focus on just a couple of these um, today. So we get the detection, and then we also, with each one of those things, when it says, I think this is a, it says, and I, here's the confidence value. And that gives you some idea uh, that you can use as a heuristic for saying, yeah, we're pretty confident that this was, in fact, a pattern. All right. Uh, or uh, instead of going to all that work, which I didn't go to all that work to produce the demo that we saw today, you could actually use a built-in model. So MLKit, TensorFlow Lite come with built-in models. You can just use uh, directly. So I didn't take training data for smiley faces and create a model and download that. Instead, I just called MLKit uh, uh, APIs directly and said, what is this thing? And it used models that uh, it automatically ships with. All right. So then how do we actually get this information from machine learning? So we extract the bitmap. So we, we know how to draw to the canvas, right? We know how to make the graphics appear on the screen. So we can get a bitmap from that information. Then we can create the data structs that we need to actually talk to the APIs, which is, in this case, a Firebase vision image. Uh, and then we can create a labeler around that image. These are you know, just the tedious details of this is what you need to do to actually ask MLKit what's going on there. You can process the data, which is taking that user data and comparing it to the built in model, uh, and then you get a callback, which gives you the information about what the machine learning model uh, or system thinks that you have displayed on the screen, and then we can display that in the UI, uh, which is what we were doing when we said, yep, we think it's a pattern, we think it's a smiley face, whatever. All right, so we get bitmap data like this. Um, so this is sort of standard. I don't know how many times I've actually written this exact code. You create a bitmap, you need a width and a height, and you always need an ARGB 8888. Um, so you get used to typing all those characters and doing code completion all the time. You need a canvas, create a canvas around the bitmap. So now when I draw uh, using that canvas, it'll actually draw into the bitmap instead of drawing into the screen. Then you return the bitmap. But wait, wait. I think. Yeah. You know, that looked kind of like Java. That could. It actually did. And this is yeah. Kotlin Comp, so. Yeah. I think we need more Kotlin. More so, Kotlin. Um, one, of the, one of the realities of APIs, like the APIs that we have in Android, is they are backward compatible, which means that the APIs that you shipped way long ago will be with you forever because we don't break applications. That's not the plan that we have uh, in the API uh, system for Android. So you can't get rid of the old ones, and sometimes that means, you, well, you can't really create new ones because that would be sort of changing the architecture. But what you could do is come out with uh, an additional library like KTX, Kotlin Extensions for Android. Android, which says, you know, here's a bunch of APIs which could be a lot easier to use if they're being used from Kotlin applications. So we've done that for various parts of the API, including a lot of the, uh, a lot of the UI aspects like bitmaps and Canvas and Drawable and stuff like that, and come out with new APIs that do similar tasks in much simpler ways. So here's the way that we wrote the code that I've written the code for years and years and years, mostly in Java, uh, to get a bitmap uh, and use Canvas to draw into it. And here's the way that you could actually make that look with KTX, right? So Ooh. you create the bitmap. Note that I didn't have to pass in the configuration type because in Kotlin, we have default parameters. And we know that usually you want that ARGB 8888 image. So we don't have to pass that in because it applies that by default. And then we can apply the canvas. We basically call this function. It passes in the canvas as the argument there. Uh, and then we reference the method that we want to call. And it's automatically going to assume the one parameter that came in. And all of a sudden, that you know six lines of code boiled down to that uh, one single line of KTX Kotlin code. Fancy. All right, continuing with the ML discussion. All right, so we create the Firebase vision image that we need from the bitmap that we got. We create this labeler that's going to operate uh, on, on that bitmap, on this user data that we have, and then do the detection in the device, uh, in, the, in the model that we have on the device. And then we call this process image API on labor, labeler. We give it a listener, and then sometime later, it's going to call us back with results. Uh, and they look something like this. It's going to be this array of information, these pairs of things that say, well, I think it's a, this kind of object, and it's a string, some metadata uh, description of this thing, as well as a confidence value, some percentage, uh, where it, it's 98% you know, confidence that it is one of those things. All right, so that 
all applied to what we saw so far, which was for the smiley face detection stuff. Now, obviously, it wasn't really working that well, especially for the on-device detection, because maybe the data that it was trained on was not really appropriate for the random scribbles that I'm doing uh, in this demo here today. So what we could do is sort of focus the data and the example around something that is much more constrained. So there's a data set out there called MNIST. Uh, it consists of many, many, many samples for just 10 kinds of images, which are for the digits. So people hand drew these things. We know what they are. Uh, there's a very finite set of things that they could be, and then we can sort of focus the example around these. So how do you work with this um, custom data then? So in general, uh, you would load the model. You get the model for this data. Um, fortunately, we have it sort of pre-produced uh, somewhere. It's in a code lab on Google Code Labs if you want it. We just stole our model, our we MS model. <laughs> borrowed. Bar we're, that's right. We're software it was engineers. licensed correctly. We reuse. That's what software <laughs> engineers do. Uh, all right, so you load the model into the system. You create an interpreter on this model. This is the equivalent of where we were creating a labeler before. Well, we create an interpreter when we're using this custom model. Uh, we, again, get the, the user bitmap data. Um, and then we're actually going to create a byte buffer out of that, tedious detail. Uh, we're going to make sure that the input data is in the same size as the ML data that we're going to compare it against. We process data just like we did before. And then we get the results back with the confidence uh, data. A little bit di different format, but same idea. So here's what some of this stuff looks like. I'm not going to go through all the details there, but basically you load the model file, and uh, this creates uh, this byte buffer of information that you're going to compare against. And then we can create an interpreter around this thing, and then we run the interpreter uh, right there. Um, and that will then synchronously call and get these results. So it, it queries the model and then uh, returns the information in this result array that we created there. All right, so back to our demo. This let's time, see some digits. It's going to be awesome. All right, so let's clear this thing, awesome though it was. And we'll say, instead of detecting shapes, let's detect digits. And I'm going to do this and draw something that looks like That's that. That's a good two. I don't know let's what see. it is. It thinks oh, it's a two. It, it, maybe. It, it maybe. May, it may also be a three, but fortunately, <laughs> it thinks it's more of a two. Um, what if we do one of these? I could just do this forever. This is fun, isn't it? It thinks it's a three, almost certain that it's a three. So that's, that's what cool. I thought. All right. Yeah. All right. But, but we should probably have some more Kotlin. Yeah, I, think so. I think we need more Kotlin. Uh, you want to talk about this? I think you should talk about this. <laughs> am I talking about this one? Yes, you are. Oh, I am talking about this one. <laughs> KTS. I was like, what is KTS? <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so um, we were like, all okay, right, we need more Kotlin in this project. So instead of using the traditional Groovy-based Gradle build stuff, we said, let's make our build files defined in Kotlin too, because we need more Kotlin. So we have, this is uh, from our Android side of the project. We have our, we're including the dependencies for like the standard library in Kotlin, uh, and then the Android Compat library and so we're including those dependencies into our project. But this is actually Kotlin code. So we've actually, this dot, dot .kts is Kotlin script. And so this is Kotlin code. It compiles, it has types, all the wonderful things about Kotlin. I put the method definitions for what's actually happening underneath the covers down there so you can see that when we do that block of dependencies, we're actually taking something that is gonna get called and apply the configuration in that block to our project. And then you can see the, uh, implement or the function for implementation there. So this is just Kotlin code. It's great, because now we can write our build in Kotlin as well. Uh, so the nice thing about this is that we can combine declarative with imperative code in our build. And the, the code that we're programming in is Kotlin. So this is just one example from our build where we say, all right, if we're doing a build for the server artifact that we're going to run on the server, we don't want to build the Android stuff or even include it. So we're just not going to include it. And it's nice that you can write this stuff in Kotlin. You can have that nice syntax for the, the function, the anonymous function there uh, to filter out um, when we want to include Android or not. So it's nice that we get both the declarative and the imperative uh, together with the Kotlin script, and that we can write it in Kotlin. All right. Um, so we saw some good things happen in local detection. Uh, 
a couple of advantages of doing local detection are faster, right? You don't have latency of asking the cloud to do something. You've got it all on the device. Um, uh, much simpler approach to everything. Uh, but sometimes it just doesn't have enough information. If you can actually go out to APIs that query to the cloud, they may have more detailed models. They may be able to spend more resources on doing detection. And then maybe then it would know that that was actually an awesome smiley face that I drew. So where we did on-device labeling before, we use this API up here, the on-device image labeler to create our labeler. Uh, we need to make a massive change to the code and change that to be cloud image labeler instead. And that will actually call Firebase APIs that go and query the server instead. Uh, so let's run another demo and see how that works. So we'll pop back here. We'll clear that amazing three. We'll go back to shape detection. And we'll do this. Self-portrait. Oh, what happened to Self -portrait your head? Self-portrait of Pac-Man. <laughs> All right. And it says, I have no idea what that is. But if I ask the cloud IDs, it says, could be a font. And I'm like, it you know be. what? It could be. It could be. Uh, if I make a sort of injured smiley face, what do we get there? <laughs> Uh, local ID still has no idea, thinks I'm an awful artist. That's actually what it should say instead. And Cloud says, you know what? That is a facial expression. And an Somewhere emoticon. Yeah. Yeah. So See? Pretty good. It knows. Pretty good. It knows. All right. Yay, Cloud. Yay, Cloud. But I think we need some more Kotlin. More Kotlin, for sure. Yeah. So, oh yeah, this is this, this is, is fun. This is about something I shouldn't have been doing. Like uh, James asked, how many UI systems I've actually you know written or used in my life? Certainly enough to know that you should not be querying uh, servers on the UI thread, right? <laughs> so after I wrote the code, there was this niggling sense of guilt that I had that I was doing something truly awful. Um, some of these things. So when you do uh, detection on device, it can take you know two or three frames. It may take tens of milliseconds to do something. Those are asynchronous calls that are actually providing the results. So not really a problem there because something is happening elsewhere and then calling you back later. That's all fine. But for the uh, digit detection that we're doing, that actually is doing a synchronous call and then returning re the results in that array that we created, which means we're basically sitting there on the main thread waiting for this information. Uh, and if that happens to be detection that is using the web, you know, good luck on that. It's going to take a second or two to return. So here, I had this interpreter.run. That is a synchronous call. That is a very bad no-no, and I should have known not to write that code to begin with. Fortunately, there was an easy fix by using Kotlin coroutine capability. So I changed this to be a suspend function instead, and then when I got to that call, I said, you know what, do this on the dispatcher's uh, scope instead. So it's going to run that on that separate scope, and then eventually uh, return, and I can go on with my life. And in the meantime, it did not freeze the UI. Oh, reactive. I love it. <laughs> That's great. But we could do even more. More Kotlin, definitely. And so uh, we have, we've been talking about the front end. And we know from what a mullet is. Actually, let's see a picture of a mullet. <laughs> That a mullet is about business in the front and party in the back, right? So thank you for covering the business side of this application. Now I get to do the party in the back um, with the server side. And so the back end, uh, here's what we're going to do. We, um, those wonderful drawings from Chet, he doesn't want to just keep those on his phone. He wants to share them with the world. And so to do that, we need a server. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a server. We're going to take that, that bitmap that was captured from, uh, from the device. We're going to do the prediction on it. We're going to get the results. And then we're going to send that up to a server. So we'll send that to a REST service. And then so that other people can get access to that, we can put it in a database. But I put it onto a message bus uh, on the bus. And then we're going to pull the bus. And then we're going to display those results in the browser. So that's our process for being able to share Chet's wonderful drawings with the world. OK, so now we get into not just an Android project, but we get into a project that has both a server side and a Android client side. And we said, hey, you know what? There's some shared data objects between those two sides. We want to be able to send data back and forth. And so let's, uh, let's create a common module in our project. And then we will allow our server side and our Android side to both share those data types. 
So we have a label annotation type, which is a data class, which takes a description and a score. That's the machine learning results. And then we have an image result, which takes the byte array, which is just our bitmap, and then the label annotations, uh, the, the predictions that we get back. OK, so we've got our common module. Great. So uh, this is all in a single project in, inside of Android. Uh, inside of, it has the Android project, it has the common project, has the server project, all inside of a Gradle uh, project. So then we needed to set up that common project so that it could be shared to multiple targets. So we created the, the build for the common module, Gradle build, again, with using KTS. And we specified some parameters around how to build it for Java and how to build it for Android. And then we also specified the build targets for Kotlin. So we specified the JVM and Android. And then we included a common set of dependencies just on the uh, Kotlin standard library. Great, so now we've got our build set up for the common module, so that now we can actually share the, those data classes, the, the label annotation and the image result. We can share those between the server and the Android app. And so then we just need to add a dependency in our server and our Android app on that common project. So super easy in Gradle to just add that dependency on the common project. And then they can take advantage of those classes. Because we, um, there was another way that we started out the first time doing this, which was to, instead of specifying a uh, Android target specifically, Android can actually use the JVM target instead. Um, but you'll see in a little bit why we uh, specified those separately, um, because we, had yet an, we have yet another target coming soon. So for the server side, I used a framework called Micronaut, uh, which is a, a newer-ish web framework, kind of like Spring Boot, if you've used that. And it uh, allows us to do annotation-driven um, programming for our HTTP handling. And so it's a nice framework, has great support for Kotlin. And so to add that to our server project, we have to include the Kotlin annotation processor because uh, Micronaut uses that to do the compile time annotations instead of runtime reflection, which is nice if you want to do something like GraalVM to optimize the image um, with the ahead of time compilation, that kind of thing. And then also starts up a lot quicker too. Uh, so then we include the dependencies for Micronaut, a uh, bunch of things there, including like Jackson for JSON serialization, and then we use the Kotlin annotation processor that's uh, part of Micronaut. So that's how we set up Micronaut. And then this is what our server-side code looks like for how we handle a request. Was I supposed to show the demo before I got into this? I have no idea. I should probably show the demo so people can see what this actually looks like. Um, okay, so let's go to our... Yep, that one, thank you. And what we're gonna do is, let's just reload that so that we start with a fresh slate, and then we're gonna go to the Android emulator. And let's actually now um, take one of these drawings, we'll just take the one that you already have there, and let's do the local ID on it, and, oh no, the emulator. That is, emulator restart. Emulator fail. I'm gonna blame that on James. <laughs> that was my fault, I touched it, I shouldn't have. Um, All right. Back to Let's relaunch that thing. There we go. Now you have to draw again. I'm because I'm do not very good at drawing. An amazing drawing again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what just happened, there you saw in the browser, we've got this, this browser app running on the internet, and the Android device sent the results up to, uh, up to the cloud service, and then the cloud service uh, just displayed those in the browser. So that was the first service that, that we're working with here. Okay, so we've got our, our cloud service that's able to receive the bitmap and the uh, results, but let's go back to the code so we can see how we actually um, built that, that server uh, with Micronaut. Okay, so I've got a post handler so that whenever there's an HTTP post to slash show, that's going to take something that can deserialize into an image result, which that image result is our bitmap and our label annotations. And then we're going to return a response, which doesn't really matter, but we're gonna take that image result and put it onto our event bus because then our browser is going to be pulling, our browser client is gonna be pulling this slash events endpoint, which just returns an HTTP response of image result. And if we get 
get an image result off the bus, we're going to display that. Obviously, different ways that we could move the data around, but this was the easiest for demo purposes. So, uh, But you can see nice API for being able to express the parameters that are accepted in via JSON and then produced via JSON on that slash events. So the JSON serialization is all handled for us, um, which is super nice with, with uh, Micronaut. Okay, then on the client side, we're also using Micronaut, but this time for the HTTP client. And so to do that, we use the at client annotation, give it the URL, which is actually a parameter. And so that parameter comes from configuration, and I'll show you how we do that in a second. And then we just create an interface, and we say, again, at post to slash show, we tell it that it's uh, the body that it's going to send is gonna be an image result. And then in this case, what we get back, we're just basically ignoring. Uh, so that's how we write our our HTTP client in Micronaut. You don't have to write any other code. We're using dependency injection, and Micronaut creates an instance of this thing that knows how to actually talk to that HTTP endpoint, and it's going to inject that draw service into our activity. And then later in our activity, uh, in our case, when we get the results back from machine learning, we say draw service.show, calling that show method um, that was defined in that interface with our image result, and then we don't care about the, the what happens, so we just uh, say subscribe, so it actually happens, and then just dispose of the, the results. So that's our client uh, running in Android and with, with Micronaut and the client, too. Okay, now one of the harder parts of this was figuring out how to get the dependency injection stuff working with Android. Uh, and so to do that, we created a base application, and there we have to set up our context for the dependency injection. So uh, I have to do a little bit of work because by default with Micronaut, it gets its property configuration information from things like JVM args. And in my case on Android, I actually want to get my configuration information from the Android manifest file and metadata in that file. So I had to do a little bit of work to figure out how to set up the, that as the configuration source. Um, but then we get that, and then we're, uh, we're then setting it up so that anytime an activity is created, the dependency injection context is available, and so that then it knows how to do the dependency injection so I can get that draw service out. But you'll remember that I externalized that draw URL parameter because I wanted us to be able to change the URL that we're talking to between development, and it's a different URL if you're running in the emulator versus running on an, on an actual device, and then be able to change that to our production server very easily. And so that's why we externalized it. And so the way that we actually are able to program that, that to be externalized was we, in the Android manifest file, added a metadata uh, tag uh, for that draw URL with a placeholder. That dollar sign draw URL is just a placeholder for a value. And then in our Android build, in our Kotlin uh, KTS file, we look to see, is there a Gradle property called draw URL? And if so, then we set that as a manifest placeholder for draw URL, which replace that in the manifest when the manifest is, is created and, and shoved into the, um, to the Android uh, file. Okay, and if it's not set, then we set a default, which is the 10.0.2.2, the IP of your machine when you're in the Android emulator. But then if you want to change the URL, you just uh, change the gradle.properties file in the root project with the URL that you want to talk to. Uh, and so that will then, then set that, that Gradle uh, build parameter and then overwrite that when the, when the Android application builds. And then you don't commit that gradle.properties file. You, you leave that out of source control. Um, that's, um, so we can change it as a developer, but not outside of that. OK, so now we needed to run our server somewhere on the internet. So I use something called Cloud Run, which is serverless for containers. So what we need is a Docker container. We need a way to, to package our application up in such a way that then we can run it on the cloud. And so Cloud Run uses Docker containers. So I have a Docker file that just runs the Gradle build to create the assets needed to run this application, which we use the shadow jar plugin to do that. And then we take that shadow jar, put it into our container along with OpenJDK 8, and then uh, we need a native library installed in our Docker container as well called font config. So we add that one in, and then we give the startup command uh, for how to start that thing. So we've got our Docker container. And then to deploy it, we set up uh, continuous delivery with cloud build. Uh, and finally, something that's not Kotlin, we get some YAML. I know everybody was really excited to get some YAML in their life today. Um, 
So we have some YAML that defines the steps to build and deploy the application. So we do Docker build on this thing. So every time uh, we're pushing, Cheddar Eye is pushing to our master repo, it's going to run through these steps. So it's going to run the Docker build. It's going to do the Docker push to the Google Container Registry, where it stores that stuff. And then it's going to say, Cloud Run, deploy that container onto a service. And that's how we end up with that URL that the phone and our browser was talking to. Demo. We already showed the demo because <laughs> uh, it was better to do it before. So that's the, the full mullet, the, the back end uh, and the, the front end, the party in the back, and then unfortunately the business in the front, but, um, but the full mullet for Kotlin. But we have more. It's <laughs> we do have more. We do have more. In fact, we have more Kotlin. More Kotlin specifically. So it occurred to me that if we're talking about Kotlin, and we're talking about UI stuff, maybe we should actually try to use some of the new, I new UI stuff that the Android team is working on. So Jetpack Compose is a new UI toolkit um, that is very pre-alpha, as I learned um, very uh, firsthand this week, uh, which is declarative and reactive, um, very trendy words right now. It tries to make it easier. I mean, this is the whole goal of Jetpack Compose, not just to do something new, but to make it easier to write Android UIs. So we have this API, set of APIs, XML declarative stuff, the logic codes, uh, all the view system, like it all works very well. But after 12 years of developments and building around constraints at the beginning, which aren't necessarily the same constraints that we have now, maybe it's not as easy as it should be to write uh, uh, these UIs that everybody needs, these rich UIs that you need in your Android applications. And we don't want to use XML, right? Let's, let's write this stuff XML, in Kotlin. So 2005, am so I right? So 2005. All right, so uh, we thought we would play around with Compose. So as I said, reactive, uh, declarative. Kotlin first, it is being developed completely in Kotlin and for Kotlin developers. So they're going to be using things like uh, coroutines. They have a Kotlin compiler for doing some really neat uh, sort of state detection and invalidation stuff automatically, um, which is funny. because uh, <laughs> So I'm going to show you Compose code here. It is real Compose code, and it actually works. However, it doesn't use the com Compose compiler. I'm probably freaking out the team by doing this. You're not really supposed to write Compose code without using the Compose compiler, because the compiler is the, sort of the smart inner thing that knows how to do the correct invalidation at the right time for all the state bits that actually change. It turns out that the stuff I was using was so bleeding edge, and all the stuff that we're doing really didn't react very well with the compiler. So I thought, you know what? I'm an Android developer. I know how to invalidate a view. So I'm just going to do that manually. And we um, probably would have spent like three more days just hacking on Gradle builds to get the thing working. Yeah. So, and I thought know. I would rather sleep and fly here instead. Uh, so as I said, developer preview, very, very pre-alpha. I had someone come to me two weeks ago and say, I have a working application using Compose. Should I ship this? I said. No, absolutely not. That's funny. That's the same answer that this other person on the team gave me. I'm like, well, just keep asking people. I'm pretty sure we're all going to say the same thing. No, pre-alpha, OK? It's very much in iteration. The layout system changed last week while I was in the middle of using it. Um, I'm hoping that they've come out with documentation for the new layout system. That'd be cool. All right, so back to a demo. Uh, all right, so we have this. Awesome little face here. And then we have this hidden little button up here that says Compose. So we can go Ooh. into Compose. You can tell that this is new because it uses garish colors to get your attention. <laughs> All right. Um, so here we are, Compose UI. And I can draw the same dumb art that I was drawing before. Your self-portrait. Oh, yep. no. no that's that, actually, enough. this is more appropriate for me. Uh, local detection. And it still says, I have no idea. Cloud detection says, oh, I got some ideas. All right, so you can see same exact functionality, but different UI. So how does this Kotlin-based UI work? So we can go in here, go back to slides. So we saw the UI before. Oh, so this is uh, the, a, a copy of the slide. Remember, reuse. All right, so this is what we did first time around, how do we track the motion events and display all this stuff. This is the stuff that I needed to change to make the stuff work and compose. So how does it work? So we saw the XML layout before, all the tr standard views. This is the equivalent of that. 
Um, this is, uh, so all the UI elements here, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but you might be able to detect some sort of obvious layout things. We have columns, we have rows and flex rows saying, you know, where the spacing is going to be here. Uh, we have some buttons in here. I've removed some of the important details, like all of these buttons actually have click listeners, so they have lambdas telling it what to do, and that's the logic that actually sends this thing into the local detection versus the cloud detection. Uh, and then the other bit that's interesting is this drawing canvas down at the bottom. Um, so one of these elements is where all the magic happens in terms of gesture detection as well as actually handling the rendering of those paths. Um, so that is the canvas over there, and we can take a look at that. That is another composable, uh, which is a Jetpack Compose thing, as you might have guessed. Uh, so raw, drag, gesture, detector. Um, so everything works in these sort of nested nodes, right? So we have a node saying, okay, everything inside of me is going to be able to detect gestures and do something with it. We have surface because I wanted a black background there. We have a container, which is a layout object that has a single child. And then we have this draw object, which is where we handle the, the very sort of manual drawing thing as the finger is dragging around on the screen. Uh, and then inside of that, you'll see some code which should look startlingly similar to what we saw before because at the inside of Jetpack Compose, we're still using the same Canvas APIs to actually do the rendering. Um, so that should be familiar to everyone already. So if we take a look at how we do gesture detection, it's oddly similar to what we were doing before because in UI toolkits, it's always something like this. Um, so here, it's a higher level gesture object uh, that detects when things are actually moving and then it'll send you an on start. So we use that as a trigger to say, okay, well, this is where we create the path and do a move to and then it detects when you're dragging and it says, okay, well, draw a line to there. And then this is the manual recompose bit that I needed to do um, because wasn't using the Compose compiler. Don't tell the team, okay? It's just our secret. Uh, all right, and then some of the details that I omitted from the earlier slide. So this is one of the buttons that actually does some of the machine learning stuff. So it's going to do a detect object here, uh, make that call, provide the listener, and then get a call back later. Um, and this is basically exactly the same code as it was in the earlier UI code. The only thing that changed um, was the object that I was embedding, embedding it within. But probably need some more Kotlin. I think we do. <laughs> yep, yep. So um, we, we were like, all right, you know, there's this web UI. You saw it where it actually, like, displayed the, the image in the, in the web browser. So that requires JavaScript, right? We got to have JavaScript to run stuff in the browser. So shouldn't we write that JavaScript in Kotlin? Absolutely, yes. right? Yes. yes, yes. The answer is yes. So we added a web uh, module, subproject, to our project. And the way that we share the assets between that web project, well, first, the web project depends on the common one. So it then gets access to those data classes that you saw earlier. And then the output of the web project is a jar file. That's what I told it to, to output because that makes it then really easy to take the JavaScript assets that have been compiled from Kotlin and put those into my server so that then my server can serve them. So to set this up, we now are using Kotlin JS and depending on the common module. And then uh, we had to tell it how to assemble that jar file that we need for our server. And this got a little bit tricky because we need to include the dependencies in our, our JavaScript, uh, Kotlin JavaScript project in our jar file. So we had to do some great old mucking to, uh, to get that working, but got that all working. We got our jar file, then uh, we, um, could build, build our actual application, which all it does is pull that endpoint that you saw earlier, the server endpoint slash events. We're using the fetch API in the browser, but nicely because we're in Kotlin, we're able to have a actual typed API and use Kotlin to talk to those browser APIs. So we do window.fetch, uh, we can use coroutines, which is awesome. And then when we get a response back, I did have to do some manual deserialization of the JSON, which was a little bit unfortunate um, because there was some incompatibility in JSON parsing, but we're able to use that image result data class that is then shared across Android, the server, and our JavaScript client. 
Then on pull, we're uh, taking that image result and we need to render it into the DOM. And so there's a really nice library, uh, Kotlin, um, some extension, <laughs> HTML, JS thing. But it gives us a DOM API in Kotlin. So it's a nice little DSL for manipulating the DOM. So uh, I just go through and get my label annotations and, and uh, add them to the DOM, essentially. So that's our, our Kotlin JS. And, and you saw that a little uh, bit ago. You'll see it again in a minute. Then our server needs to depend on the jar file that's output from, uh, from that, that web project. And so I would have liked to have just added this as a normal dependency. Unfortunately, that didn't work because it, it wasn't the right type of jar file. And so I had to depend on the jar file directly. And then I needed to specify a task dependency on our web uh, JS jar task. But great, now we've got this jar file in our class path as a dependency. And so now I configure, uh, configured Micronaut to ha be able to handle static asset requests basically into the class path location that those assets are located. And then we're able to render those assets uh, from the Micronaut server. Then we have an HTML page, which really just pulls in the JavaScript file, uh, files um, that we need to run this application. We could have used uh, something like require.js uh, to be able to load these automatically. Um, but just for simplicity, I just loaded them all manually. So that's, that's our whole HTML file there. And then we probably need, probably need some more Kotlin. Probably some more Kotlin. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have all these projects, the Android, the Common, the Server, uh, the Web, all in the same project. So they're all sub-projects. And so um, we set it up so that it's all one Gradle project that can build all these. So we've got our root Gradle build. Um, so one project to Kotlin them all. Right? Did you see that? I, I, yeah, that was I think good, that huh? Works. Yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, so our root, gr our root Gradle build, uh, it, all that it does is include the Kotlin Gradle plugin. And then for some strange reason, I also had to include the Android Gradle plugin at the root level instead of at the Android level, but whatever, it worked. Um, <laughs> so that, actually, probably that's probably a good phrase there. for software <laughs> development overall, I think. Whatever. Whatever, it worked. It worked. Yeah. But we probably need. Even more. Even more Kotlin. Kotlin. Yep. Yep. Right. Uh, so we, we thought about, all right, how can we actually like, do something a little more interesting and do take just raw data from a phone and send that to a server instead of sending the bitmap and then uh, be able to process that data on the server, create the image on the server, and then render that in the same way that you've seen before. And so let's actually show you a demo. I'm going to need your face. Is, did that work? Can I just hold the phone up to your face? And it, it works. Okay. It works. Yeah. Awesome. I unlock and then, all the phones. Yeah, it's, you've got the magic key, huh? Okay. So let's, let's give this a try. So what we're going to do is we are reading the accelerometer data from the phone. And so I've got to like click a button and then uh, draw a shape like a circle and then tell it that I'm done drawing. And then it's going to send that accelerometer data up to the cloud. I it's just want to point out that is an even worse smiley face than the ones that I drew. <laughs> It's true. You are a better artist. <laughs> but I am drawing with an accelerometer, which is not easy. Um, so we take that accelerometer data, draw the, the thing that we just drew in the air, and then give that to a machine learning API. This is the Vision API on Google Cloud. And then get the, uh, the, the machine learning results back, and then take the bitmap and the machine learning results and return those in the response to the phone. So my phone got the response with that data. But then also, because we put that on the bus, then we're able to get that off the bus in the browser as well. So that all worked and was, was pretty, pretty fun. Um, so that's the, the process that we walked through. It was a little bit tricky to figure out how to map accelerometer data into a, a shape that is drawn in the air. Um, but with enough math, um, we were able to, to figure that out on the server. Um, we uh, do a bunch of, of manipulation of that data to like smooth it out and that sort of thing. But you see, that's, there's an orientation data class that is in the common module uh, that all the sensor data goes into, and then that becomes the thing that we send up to the server. You'll see that's the client side in Android that we use to send it. 
And then the server side where we have our post handler where we receive those list of orientation and then uh, figure out how to turn it into an image. Turns out turning it into an image is a little bit tricky. And I think you actually wrote some of this Java AWT code that I'm using Back in here, the day. Back, back in the day. day uh, to, to take that thing. But we do some interpolation on the data, um, bounds check-in and all sorts of fun stuff. And then ultimately we get this image, uh, this bitmap that then we can, we can take on to the next step of the processing. So you can see all the code uh, on your own. But... Um, there were some challenges. I think we've covered a lot of them as we went through. I think so. We'll whip through them pretty quick before they turn off the lights on us. All right. <laughs> I think you we complained have, over and over about some of the Gradle build issues. There were some, had, there were some challenges there. Uh, JSON was hard because not all JSON serializers and ser deserializers work the same. So that was, that was fun. Uh, externalizing the URL, I finally like, figured out the right way to do it with Micronaut dependency injection and all that, but finally got that all externalized nice. Um, math was hard. Uh, that was that was not surprising, but it turns out things like if uh, if the path that you're drawing in crosses over the North Pole, then your data is no longer contiguous. And then you have to figure out how to like get the opposite side of a sphere. And uh, it gets a little tricky. And it's especially um, difficult in Denmark because we're basically at the North Pole here. So you're crossing it every time you every move time. anywhere. Every yep. time, yeah. Uh, ML is hard, uh, just sort of figuring out what to do, some of the uh, synchronous versus asynchronous behavior, um, what, what it was detecting, like what is actually in this hidden model. I think ideally, uh, there are large data sets of scribbles out there that it would be nice to sort of build something custom with um, instead of just using the one that was built in and really not knowing if it's going to know what a smiley face is or not. Uh, Compose is very, very young. Layout's changing from underneath me. Uh, the compiler not really wanting to behave with what we were trying to do made this especially tricky, but we did get to the end with actual Compose working minus the compiler bits. Uh, again, don't tell the team. Uh, but we got things working. We've got stuff. Uh, we've got Kotlin on the Android client. We've got uh, Kotlin build files. We've got Kotlin on the server uh, and even Kotlin JS for the web client. So it's the full mullet. That's the full a lot Kotlin of Kotlin. Mullet. That's a lot of Kotlin. So all the code is available up on our GitHub, Google Cloud Platform, AirDraw demo. So check it out uh, and um, give us your feedback. Uh, help me fix some bugs in my math, too. That would be nice. So, Thanks. Thank you.